by other people, by friends, by colleagues. Personally, I much prefer radio interviews. The experience you have, the more um, able you are to get your point across. Gradually, of you get accurate. used to the experience. I think that one of the biggest factors that make a successful interview is being very disciplined and very focused. And the times I have performed badly is when I have rushed into some interview without preparation. The whole point of the interview is not so much what you say, but what the person at the other end actually hears or sees. So it's very much a kind of one-sided dialogue, if you like. And, you know, be real about this. Interviewers are not the most skilled people in the world very often, and you can actually control the process more than most people know. Prince Philip House is all about challenging the way we provide public services. But more importantly for the university, developing very modern ways of educating the workforce. So what sort of training do we need? to ensure that our future doctors and nurses and social workers are really able to provide integrated teamwork. Because this is new, because this is not replicated widely yet, I need a vehicle that will help me disseminate this information. You make contacts by being seen on the, uh, in the media, on TV, and of course it publicises the kind of work you're doing, which can be very useful and attractive and, and exciting. It does focus attention on the university. It's good in the recruitment of students and we've had students who've said, you know, well I, I read about what you were doing or I heard you on the radio or I saw you on TV. The other reason why the media is, is particularly uh, useful for us, I think, is that, is that the area of research we're involved in involves the media. Uh, and we actually have to have a presence in that world, I think. You know, we need contacts in the world of football. And, and they don't read academic journals and, and the kinds of books that we produce. And almost it, it, it's a reminder that we exist and that we're involved and that we've got things to say. I certainly changed my mind and became quite an early convert to the importance of public understanding of science and helping the public become aware of what you're doing. We've been involved over the years in Horizon programmes, Sky at Night obviously, and so I suppose it must go back to about uh, mid-60s or something when there was the first sort of public interest in what we were doing. I think it's important to be aware of what could be of interest more widely whether it's in research or some new teaching initiative or some new statistic. My own subject is, is slightly different from the subject of, of many others who work in the university. I think there's quite a lot of people in the university who the media are quite in awe of, simply because the, the, the level of technical expertise they have and the sorts of subject subjects they're talking about are the kinds of things that people in universities are supposed to do. One of the uh, easier aspects of dealing with the media from our point of view is that the media is generally not hostile. Whereas my subject is slightly different. My subject is the kind of subject which lots of people already have opinions on. You know, they wonder why there should be expertise at all. And I think, you know, journalists have a little less reverence for, for people who work in the kind of areas that I do. Because I'm dealing in an area that has potentially explosive consequences of media, particularly if I patronise a poor community, particularly if I offend a patient or offend a health service trying earnestly to provide services. It can have terrible consequences for the future. So it's a double-edged sword. I need it, but I need to be very, very respectful in the way that I work with the media. It's hard to know how to control the link you have with the media, to be in control of the process, which is, I think, what you try and aim for. I would like to feel that every interview I participate in, that I'm in full control. I know in reality the journalist, the TV editor, the radio producer, has their own agenda, which may not uh, correlate with my agenda. It's important if you can have an input into shaping what they want, want to cover, 
often what they come and think and come to find and think are the most important points are not the most important issues. And you can change their agenda. One of the things that it is important to avoid, especially in a short interview, is a bad early question or an irrelevant early question, you know, which really throws you. And it, it probably means that in the two or three minutes that get broadcast, you never quite get round to the important story or the important point you'd like to make. The difference between an academic approach and, a, and an approach you have to use in the media is the academic approach, you can basically say what you want to say and make all the relevant qualifications. Whatever you think the media want to hear, if you cut it down by about half, you're still overrunning. And this is a difficulty. For me, it's very difficult to be concise. And really you have to think about it sometimes in terms of how you might think about, uh, about lectures with students. That you never give everything the, the, that one can find in the books to students. You give maybe two or three key ideas. And therefore I will pick out three or perhaps four key points. And I will sit down and I will rehearse in my mind exactly the statement I want to say. Some of the jargon that we would normally use is f more foreign to uh, perhaps the general public. And so I think an important point is to avoid using jargon. It's better to assume that your audience has uh, no knowledge rather than to start using technical terms. If this is a press interview, unless it's just a very short piece of news as opposed to an in-depth uh, report, then I would always write, even my quotes, I would actually write what, what Dr Lennox said. And that might sound a bit presumptuous, but at least there is no excuse for them misinterpreting you. In general, it's important to give the journalist as much help as you can. And of course you can do that in advance with an intelligent press release that concentrates on the story and gives a few facts that it's important maybe to get across. It saves us a lot of time. You know, the, the, a lot of journalists who you never even see or have contact with uh, because they're quite happy with a, a press release. The first paragraph, in a sense, I think should be the abstract of the story. Uh, and then there's the, the meat, if you like, comes in the middle. And then maybe you want to finish off with, uh, with a sort of catchy conclusion or summary. I guess very similar to the way you, we used to be taught, at least in my day, writing an essay. It's very helpful as well, I think, if you can offer the, a photograph to go with the story. When the TV crew come into the surgery, there's a lot of preparation that wouldn't take place if it was a, a radio interview or a journalist. It means you have to move your room around. You can't, for example, sit in front of your normal desk in the normal situation and expect everything to carry on as if there's no change. So a good example is here I'm sitting in front of a desk that is not normally a desk I sit in front of. I'm sitting by a computer screen that isn't my computer screen. And although I've taken the trouble to put the logo for our University of Leicester at the forefront, if we look on the right-hand side of this screen, there is a card here with the words burnt out. It doesn't reflect my work in any way. So my advice would be to look around very, very carefully in the room that you are asked to give an interview. If you're not happy about that room, just don't do it. Go into an area that you feel comfortable with, that you're comfortable with the surroundings. They feel that they can take all kinds of liberties with you. You know, they, they, they want to completely rearrange your room or they want to try and get you to do things sometimes that, that might appear to be slightly ridiculous or demeaning. And I think you should try and resist those, those sorts of requests if you don't feel comfortable with them. I've had a few of those. You can spend half a day um, messing around producing something that will take uh, one minute or two minutes when it's broadcast. But you do have to play along a little. It's a, it's a visual medium. They need uh, shots to make it work. They need, it to need to make it visually interesting for TV and you should be prepared for that. So they'll want the, maybe the computer in the background and me working on the computer or reading a book or picking books off the shelves and, and that kind of thing. It's not unsurprising that the camera crew may want me to walk into Prince Philip House because that's setting the scene for them, an external view of Prince Philip House. 
Because I'm in a surgery, patients expect to see what they would regard as a typical surgery setting. So it's not uncommon for them to want to see the racks of medical records. And again, we're having issues of confidentiality. In the Space Research Centre here, we have uh, clean rooms where equipment that goes into space will be actually put together or tested. So it's a quite popular location, you know, for the cameras to go into the clean room. Well, that means everybody has to get dressed up in protective gear and so on. And, and then, you know, that really can take ages. But on the other hand, it can pay off in giving you some, you know, really interesting uh, and quote unquote realistic pictures, you know, of the way we work. Personally, I much prefer radio interviews. Because, of course, radio is a, it works in a medium that we're all used to working in. I mean, it works with, with words and with description. It's a very nice buzz to be in a live radio studio with an interviewer who you've often met many a time, seeing the whole, the whole program moving around. And generally, the radio will give you a longer time to explain what it is that you're wanting to get across. And Certainly in you know, channels like Radio 4, I think the, the level that you're allowed to uh, talk at, if you like, is, is also a bit, a bit higher. Exotic objects like neutron stars or black holes. The first tip would be to ask yourself, why have you been asked? And it may seem very flattering to be asked to uh, be involved in an interview, but you need to make sure you're the right person. Set the agenda, if you like, for starters, so that um, that might mean agreeing in advance and, and guiding, if you like, in advance the, the questions that, that are asked during the interview. So work out what the benefits are, have I really got what they want, what the ground rules are for this. It's very easy to want to get your three or four key statements across in your interview. But remember, you're not talking to the, the journalist or the interviewer. This statement is going to go to a wide section of the public and therefore before you launch into the key points it's very, very important to start with a setting the context statement. It's, it's very important for the public to see you as a humane person and somebody who truly has empathy over the subject matter raised. It's important not to be too ambitious. If you can get through two or three interesting points that the listener or viewer will take away, then I think that you've, you've been, to some extent, successful. And in recorded work, and most of it is recorded work, you can stop at any at time and say, this isn't what I, what, I, what I planned, or can I do this again? Try and manage and control the process as, as, as much as you can. So don't be afraid to manipulate and move the question in order that your key comments, your key points, are actually illustrated in this interview. I'm going to stop that because it's crap. <laughs> Can we turn that around? Actually, don't you put that on? <laughs>